you're clearly very well versed in this world, but was there like one kind of experience or like nugget that inspired the need to write the story? No, it was one of those ones I did not know where it came from. I, I had done a couple of jobs where I was around child actors and I was a little obsessed with the people who were their agents, some of them, not all of them, a couple of them, who were kind of people who worked almost exclusively with kids and were kind of struggling in a, in a part of the business that people didn't hold in the highest regard, you know, and the, the fact that they were kind of banking everything on finding some 10-year-old thoroughbred that they were going to ride to the big time, it seems, it seems like a, a blank idea for a comedy. And then uh, what I wrote ended up being kind of a metaphor for a lot of other things I clearly feel about stardom and the obsession with it and the savagery of show business, but also business. And then uh, when I looked a little deeper at the thing I wrote, I, it also had an emotional core that was about something that meant a lot to me that I was surprised to find that I was writing about, which was the way kind of deep wounds from when we're young kind of stick with us and, and we kind of can get stuck in their orbit until we either get free of it or die. How would you describe the tone of this? Because like comedy and drama, I guess maybe even how would you compare it to Choke? Um, it's funny, Choke also had a kind of dark comic tone that was unusual, so I guess I'm kind of drawn to that. This definitely has moments of it that are very much, that are very comedic, especially when we first are introduced to this world, but as you peel back the layers, it becomes more of a drama with comedy, I feel like, as I got into it. It had a kind of film noir feel to it that became a real part of the style. And why the break between Choke and this? Is it like you just needed time to develop the script, Ooh, or...? Um, that's a really good question. I didn't really want a break. It took me, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to write next. Uh, I got busy with Marvel movies for a while. You did? Yes. <laughs> and, um, and suddenly I was working a lot more as an actor when I started writing so Choke. I was really a screenwriter who yeah. acted in movies sometimes and was wanting to direct something. And uh, things shifted a little bit. I started to get a lot more work as an actor. I got busy. And having gotten really busy in between the two, have you noticed now, having gone back on set, have you noticed your process change at all? Maybe something you took from like Josh Whedon or something, someone you worked with? Well, it's funny, there was definitely things I got. There's an imaginative component in, in my movie. There's a, as this, as this loser agent for child actors gets more desperate and things seem to be more slipping through his fingers, we really get inside his head and there's an imaginative world, the movie within the movie, that his young and brilliant um, client, played by the fabulous Saxon Charbonneau here, um, is about to get, and he starts to see this movie, this weird kind of Twilight-esque sci-fi vampire movie, he calls it, he starts to see it in front of him. And so there was things that I got and connections and friends that I had from the Marvel movies who helped me to kind of realize that. But at the same time, having done Just Week as much to do about nothing, in 11 days at his house, I came, you know, I stopped waiting for enough money to do the bigger version of this I hope to and did a kind of small version for in 20 days, inspired by what Joss was able to pull off. And what was the shooting process like? I imagine super quick, maybe not 11 days, but... Yeah, I wasn't, it wasn't my goal to write something for myself. I, I wrote a script that I thought I'd just direct and write and kind of have a break. And, uh, and then I fell in love with it and I, and there was, I don't know, go figure, there was something about a 50-year-old loser that it, it felt, felt right to me, it felt personal, and uh, especially this kind. And also everybody who works in show business or the movie business, you get beat up. I got beat up for years, you know, and I got my heart broken many times. And, and I felt like I had to do that. So even though I woke up a bunch of nights thinking, okay, there must be a way I can get this to Hector X, um, I also somewhere instinctively knew that the chaotic process of trying to shoot this piece in 20 days and to be in every scene would lend itself to the chaotic desperation.
inspiration of Howard Holloway, the character. And what I didn't realize was that finding, finding <clears throat> what I didn't realize was that finding a young actress like Saxon, who I had this kind of immediate connection with and rapport with, gave us a relationship that was had to be instantly deep and go to deep places, and scary places. And so we were having that relationship in a lot of ways while the camera was rolling in ways that also seemed to really benefit the process. How was the whole search process to fill that role too? Because it's kind of funny because you have like the reality and your script crossing over in a way. There were a lot of ways. I mean, I found a young actress after weeks of terror, so I wasn't finding anyone to really kind of make it feel real and still get the turns that this character goes through. And, and then I found someone who had just arrived in town, who had done a little bit of work, but it was really new, and had a kind of, a lot of people felt like young actors, and she felt like a young person. And it was a big relief because we were gonna not shoot a movie. You know, I'd been, I knew once I cast myself, I was going to have to surround myself with people who would kind of make the financiers relax. So then I was lucky enough to get people who I knew and were friends who I'd worked with, who also had the ability to, mostly even legends really, to nail this kind of comedy tone and then dark and dramatic, more dramatic than dark, um, moments later. So I, hired, I went to Sam Rockwell, who was the lead in Choke, and he was generous and said, yeah, I'll do it. Whatever we do, I'll do it. And, and pretty soon more people wanted to join. So I got William H. Macy and Felicity Huffman and Molly Shannon, who I went to NYU with and had always wanted to work with. And, um, did I say Amanda Peet? No. Amanda Peet and DC Nash and Paul Sparsh, just great actors came in. Allison Janney, who I'd done the West Wing with. So we had this great cast, but I didn't have my Lydia. And it was really anxious making. It was the first of many anxious making things. And then um, Saxon walked in and like I said, there was no second choice. She was the one. We knew it in one second. I still made her come back and read with me because it was such a big decision a couple of times. And uh, But I knew in a couple of minutes. I knew I was better when I was acting with her. And how was it for you, stepping into that world of all these prominent actors? Was it in, I'm sure it was exciting, but was it intimidating at all? It was nerve-wracking. It was, I was a little bit nervous. Um, when I got it, I didn't actually know who was going to be in it, you know, like, I actually found out, found out that he was the writer in one of our work sessions. Um, that's true, I changed the line. She said, are you sure that's okay? And I said, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure, because it's all right. She looked at the front page of the script, Oh, you wrote this? Yeah. It's really good. <laughs> it was fun. But that's, you know, that's a drawback, because I would change my lines all the time, but I wouldn't let her change hers. <laughs> no, I mean, I was just excited to work, really. I mean, I was really, like, really interested. You were ready to go. Yeah. What was amazing about you is you had such a, like, an athletic attitude. <laughs> kind of, what? Now I want to do it again. I'm not happy. Let's try that again. You know, and I was felt very protected, but I felt like you—you you had a great confidence. Why do you think you were so confident? Did you not feel confident inside? I mean, I was nervous inside. I mean, I mean, who wanted this? This was like. But well, once you got it. Yeah. Then it was I. Part of it seemed to me that you could do it. Yeah. I mean, who else you know that? I didn't know I could do it. Well, I mean. You know you're gonna, an actor. Yeah. Somewhere deep down, you just know you're an Yeah, I, I... She is. And how is it being an actor and a director? When you're directing your actors, do you, like, have your own techniques kind of pop out and try to, like, give people advice like that? It's okay to be the actor-director. There's a, there's, a, like, there's a rule that any healthy actor sticks to, which is you don't direct the other person. If you want them to do something different, make them do something different in the scene. You know what I mean? By what you're doing. And so you're crossing that when you're acting, but I hired people who I had trust with, who I knew I could say, can we try one like this? Or, and they were so generous about going, what do you want? You want something different? And they were really kind when I did the worst thing you could possibly do, which comes from being the writer, actor, director, which is, I'd be 
I'd be watching the in rehearsal. I'd be watching the scene for the first time, and I would sometimes mouth their words, <laughs> which is so awful and really distracting for them. And my pal Felicity Hoffman was like, "Honey, honey." I love you. You don't have to take care of me. The writing's good. Let's just do the scene. And I was like, okay, well, well. She said, no, okay, but you're mouthing my words. And I said, oh, well, now, now I kind of want to go home, but I, I won't do it anymore. And there was a couple when I was editing. There was definitely a couple of takes I couldn't use because Saxon was acting, and I was going. <laughs> How is it having your final product and bringing it to, to Tribeca? Why, I mean, why Tribeca? Um. It's an amazing experience. It was a, it was an unusual piece. It was funny and dramatic and noir and just it has this imaginative component that I mentioned. And people, when we were trying to raise the money, people read the script. They said, some parts of this I don't know how you're going to pull this off on this budget. I don't know if this will work. And I agreed with them. I didn't know if it was going to work. And there's been it's been a long process of. Actually, it hasn't been very long. It just felt very long. We finished the movie 10 days ago. I never saw the visual effects in the film until 10 days ago. They're a big part of it. They're important. It's not a huge amount of time, but they're really important. It only started to really work, in my opinion, 10 days ago, but I felt, for me, when I saw all those pieces together, finally, I thought, oh, this is what I wanted to do. Uh, this is the blend, the unusual blend I wanted to come up with, and I feel the performances around me are magical, and uh, I won't know really what it's like until... They, someone told me that your blood inside you is blue, and that when it hits the air it turns red. And I feel like it's, the movie's blue blood right now, it's never really been exposed to the air, and I won't know, this is so terrifying, I won't know until the 950 people come Saturday night and I feel their reactions. You can't figure out what other people are going to like, and even if you could, you stop being able to see it in the same eyes when you work on that long. So all you can really go with is there's something about this that I wanted to see, and I feel like we've executed that. I'm excited to show it to people. I'll be excited to see what their reaction is. I hope, I hope what they experience watching it is even a tenth as surprising and moving and funny as the process of doing, making the movie was for us.